Hi, my name is David Scott. I work for Docker in Cambridge in the UK, and I'm going to talk about new desktop file sharing features. I'd like to start with a bit of context by describing a common developer workflow, the kind of kind of workflow that you know I use every day. I guess most of you do too. And of course, it starts with uh, source code, which I've loaded here in my IDE, which is Visual Studio code, and I make some changes, and then I hit save and then the changes are saved to a disk on my host. But then I want to compile my code, I want to test it, I want to check whether it works. So of course I run Docker and I use docker run-v or docker compose and I share the, uh, the, the source code volumes with my container. And the code in that container can then compile and it can run, it can run tests and I can expose ports and then I can have a web browser and I can connect to the ports and test my, my app and see if my changes work. Then I can uh, play with it for a bit, then I can go back to my editor, make some changes, and the cycle is complete. And I can round and round the cycle many, many times, as quickly as possible, and I want it to be uh, nice and quick and efficient. And uh, a key part of this cycle is step number two, which is where the files are shared with the container. And this talk will be about that, this file sharing part. So file sharing, I believe, is key to this workflow. It's really a fundamental part, part of it, and it must be reliable for a start, because if I make a change in my editor and then I don't see the change in the container, then I'm going to be chasing uh, highs and bugs all day. That wouldn't be much fun at all. It's going to be fast because nobody likes waiting around for things to propagate or things to happen. So as fast as possible, so I make a change and I get the results. I don't want to be like having a coffee and then coming back. And here's a more subtle one. It must support iNotify. And iNotify is a type of um, event, a file system event in Linux whenever a file changes. And uh, whenever a source code changes and Linux knows about it, it makes one of these events. And then tools like the NPM development web server can receive these events and do an automatic page refresh. That's very useful. Otherwise, you've got a poll which is inefficient or you've got to you know, manually refresh. So as I'm going to show in this talk, uh, to make this work reliably and fast with iNotify, this requires different approaches on Mac and Windows, and it requires different approaches depending on which ver Windows version you're using. Okay, so I'll start with Windows and describe what we were doing before a fairly recent desktop build, uh, 2200. So we used to use uh, SMB or SIFS, and so we would share the drives on the host, and we would mount them in Linux VM where Docker was running. And there were lots of problems caused by this. For a start, the Docker desktop application itself sometimes wouldn't start because when you try to start the VM, the VM has a network adapter, which it needs to talk to the host for the file sharing. And this adapter would be blocked by the endpoint security software that some people had, which is a bit of a shame, a bit of a blocker. Another issue was that uh, to mount the drive, you have to have some authentication. Obviously, not, any, not just anyone can mount the drive. So we needed to ask the user for credentials. We needed to store those in the Windows Credential Store, which obviously is something we don't really want to have to do because it's just we'd, we'd, we'd ideally not store any passwords at all. Um, we had to do that, but this had the side effect that we couldn't support Azure AD and we couldn't support... Um, interesting things like smart card login. It was username and password only. So that was a bit of a blocker as well. And then I mentioned the network adapter and a consequence of using the network like that is you've got to then have IP addresses on both ends and these can clash with other things. And ultimately the user had to manage the clashes. So there was a bit of a user interface thing to let them to change the subnet mask. There's a bit of a clunky and a poor user experience. And then finally, there was no actual caching really, and certainly no iNotify. So unfortunately, if you saved files on the host, then the uh, Linux VM wouldn't notice. So you had to use polling or something else. So what do we do? In desktop 2.2.0.0, we created a new file sharing implementation, which is Fuse based, like the one we have on the Mac. So Fuse is the uh, Linux file system and user space. It's um, a simple way of making custom file systems. So we have 
a custom file system using a, a custom transport. So we use these things called um, hypervisor sockets. So rather than using Hyper-V networking, where you have the adapter that has to get plugged in and sometimes can't be, and you have to use IP and you have to use routing and you have to enable firewall holes and that kind of thing. Rather than all of that, we have shared memory between the, uh, the VM and the host and with a nice socket abstraction on the top. And so this is uh, very simple, very secure and very fast. So this is great. And also the, uh, the server part runs as part of the desktop app itself. It runs as a user process, which means that whenever it tries to open a file, the Windows kernel checks whether you have access to that file. So the kernel does all the nice uh, privilege checking, which would be, uh, be a different story if that server ran as administrator, because then obviously we would be having to do access control checks, which wouldn't be good. So it's good that the server runs as the user. So that's quite secure. And similar, and similarly, also, we don't need to have any authentication because uh, there's no uh, SMB server anymore. There's no username and password involved. Uh, um, it's just uh, connections from the VM to the process on the host asking if they can read and write files. So no authentication required. It's all secure because of the hypervisor sockets because it's on the host only. And uh, yeah, no need to authenticate or handle passwords. And no need for IP or to manage addresses. So that simplifies the user experience. So people can log in with smart cards and that kind of thing if they want to. And Azure ID works. So that's much better now in Windows in desktop 2.2.0.0. Oh, yes, I almost forgot. Yes, as of course, we added some caching. So we've turned on as much caching as we could because caching is important for performance. And we're able to implement and notify, which is the thing that we could do on the Mac as well with a similar fuse based implementation. So now we have caching and then notify on Windows by default as of 2.2.0.0. So I can give you a quick demo of that with my first React app. I'll switch to my Windows machine. And here we are on Windows. And I'm going to run a Docker command. I'm going to share my source code, which is in this directory. And I'm going to expose port 3000. And I'm going to run node, give myself bash. And I've got the image already. And my app is in a directory called my app. And I'm just going to start the uh, the node development web server. So this just takes a few uh, few seconds to get going, particularly the first time because the files haven't been cached yet. And so they're fetched from the host. And hopefully when they're cached, then accesses are faster. So uh, I've also got on my host VS code and I've got the source code open. And so here it is. And I've got a web browser window. Now, once the server starts, Yep, there it is. I shall connect to it. Yep, there's my app, such as it is. Now I'm going to make some changes. I'm going to insert some typos. Let's see what happens. I saved it, and now you can see it's compiling. And it will, inch oh, it refreshes. And I'll just test it again. Test, test, test. Save that, and boom, it's changed again. It's much faster second time because of all the caching. So this has just shown the default new file system sharing implementation in 2200 and onwards based on Fuse rather than Samba, which has identify support and caching. So I'll go back to my slides. But even though it's got caching, uh, there can still be performance problems with Fuse. So I've got a couple of tips to um, help people get the most out of it. So the first tip is if you have data which is not like source code, but it's more like a, like a database backend. Like if you have a if you have like MySQL or MariaDB, and it has files that it stores its own data in, you never edit those on the host yourself because they're in some binary format. So you don't need them to be on the host. So what you shouldn't do is put them on the host because it's very slow. What happens is all the requests are remoted to the host, making it slow. And also you may have a problem with the uh, the file system semantics because the Linux database is expecting a Linux file system and Windows file systems aren't quite the same. We do our best to make one join to the other, but there are always going to be some rough edges. And so you might find that the database doesn't, isn't very happy being run on Windows. So instead, change your uh, compose file to have a volumes, a named volume section. I've created one called database and just use that. And this will be um, stored inside the VM instead in the varlib docker, I think. And it'll be persistent. And it'll, between runs, it'll be fast because it's native on Linux and it'll have exactly the right semantics for the file system because it's a Linux file system. So it's, there's no issue there. So that's tip number one. If you've got things like a database, 
put them in Docker volume, much, much better. Tip number two, if you have things you do want to share, just try to minimize the size of them. So here I've made a deliberate mistake, which is to share my entire home directory with a container. The problem here is that all the updates uh, inside my home directory, even those unrelated to my application, will be synchronized with the VM, it will be very slow and use a lot of CPU. So we don't want that. So the thing to do is to be specific and share exactly what you need, like the project directory. That means only updates within the project directory will be shipped into the VM and nothing else. So that'll make performance much better. So those are my two tips. Docker volumes for databases and minimizing size of shared volumes. Those two tips are valid for both Mac and Windows. But there's a whole new exciting, exciting possibility now. We have uh, Windows 10 2004 just released days ago. Um, uh, that has a new feature called uh, WSL2. It's a new feature, very good feature, and it's generally, generally available, and it's extremely flexible. It runs a Linux kernel and Windows kernel side by side. Um, it's just fantastic, and all the file systems are mounted in both directions. So Linux files are mounted in Windows, and Windows files are mounted in Linux. So wherever you are, whether you're a Linux shell or a Windows shell, you can access everything. That's a thing to think about. And it's got extremely high performance, particularly when you access Linux files from the Linux file system. That's the thing I'm going to emphasize in a minute. So I want to emphasize that uh, a thing called Linux workspaces are really, really good, and I would recommend using them. So what I recommend you do is um, if you uh, can, if using VS Code, then there's a very handy extension called Remote WSL, which will allow you to connect into uh, into code running inside the WSL Linux environment, and it acts as if it's all local. So that's really nice. And separately, if you run WSL to enter the Linux environment, so leave PowerShell, enter Linux, and then run VS Code with code dot, that will actually run the Windows VS Code. Even though you run it in Linux, it's it's, uh, it's uh, all joined up. So you run the thing from Linux and it runs the Windows VS Code, but it translates the paths for you. And so you can see your code and you can edit it. And then again, from Linux, if you do docker run v, it just works. And you get the really, really fast performance because it's Linux file systems to Linux containers. So you, you, the result of that whole thing, I'll demo in a minute, is that uh, you've got VS Code running natively on Windows. So in one window, you've got like Windows, VS Code, your source code's in it. You can edit your source code. Your source code, when it's saved, is actually saved in Linux in WSL. And then your containers are running in Linux and WSL, and they have native access to those files with native performance and full semantics. It's perfect. So I shall give you a quick demo. It's my second React app. This is my second Windows machine, which is running WSL and Docker Desktop. So I'm going to start by, from my PowerShell, type WSL to enter the Linux environment. Now note that it's put me in the actually the Windows, my Windows home directory, which is mounted on Mint C. I don't want that because using that is going to be quite slow. So I'm going to go to my Linux home directory with CD and have a look for where my app is in this directory. And I'm going to run VS Code. That's running a Windows binary from Linux, which will magically make the window appear on Windows, but translate the path into the Linux path, which is pretty cool. So there's a source code. And I'm then going to run Docker node LTS with port 3000. And I'm going to start the server. And there we are, just a second or two for it to warm up. There we go, and I can load the page. So there's my app, and if I go to my Windows VS Code and oops, make the same kinds of edits that I made before, I'll make some typos, hit save. Oh, that was fast. And again, there we go, that was fast. So this is on uh, recent Windows, Docker Desktop, WSL2. I've got my native VS Code running, and I've, it's editing my source code, which is actually stored in Linux, which means that the file access is really fast from the container, which gives me like a, you know, the best of both worlds, really. I've got like Windows ID and Windows UI, but the Linux performance behind it. 
So yeah, performance, how does it compare? So if you had to choose between Fuse and WSL2, so I did a I did a quick uh, comparison. I used the uh, NPM start as a benchmark, a way to see when uh, how long it took for the server to come up. And the very first run of Fuse is quite slow. It took me one time 40 something seconds. It's really quite slow. A second time I ran it in Fuse much faster because much of the content had already been cached. So that's good. But then I switched to the WSL2 Linux workspaces where the code is stored in Linux accessed from NPM in Linux, but edited remotely on Windows. And of course, the start time was really, really quick. And the first and second time was even more quick because of course Linux was further caching. So uh, you can see that, uh, yeah, if you want to optimize your uh, your iterations, then uh, using WSL2 Linux workspace is definitely a good idea. So here's your, uh, you know, what should I choose if I'm running Windows? If WSL2 is available, I would definitely recommend using it. And the trick is just to bear in mind you've got both Windows and Linux side by side. So you've got two parallel file systems and performance is very sensitive to where the files are and where the containers are. So I would recommend always using the WSL command enter the Linux shell and use Docker from inside there and launch VS Code from there. So if you haven't got WSL2 available uh, because you have to use an old version of Windows, make sure you run a recent version of Docker Desktop with lots of performance optimizations and uh, minimize the size of shared file systems because the larger they are, the more um, events have to be injected, the more cache and validations have to be injected. And things, do things like use Docker volumes for databases because the databases have to be really fast and have Linux semantics. So how does it all compare with a Mac? On Mac, we use a tool called OSXFS and it uses Fuse to share files with the host but we have some problems with it. For a start, we often get very high CPU load, particularly when lots of files change at once. And you can mitigate that to some extent uh, by following the tip I gave earlier about limiting the size of the directory trees that are shared. But even still, uh, it has less aggressive, less aggressive caching than on Windows. So it's just not quite as efficient, um, unfortunately. And also the um, user interface is fairly hard to use. You have to say on a per, docker run dash v per volume basis. Uh, you have to say it can be cached, which is basically read caching, or it can be delegated, which is effectively write caching. But we only have implemented the read caching, so uh, delegated and cached mean the same things in practice. And as I say, the caching isn't that aggressive, so the performance isn't that good. So to uh, uh, mitigate that and to make life much easier and better, we have a new feature in Desktop Edge, and this uses a tool called uh, Mutagen, which is a very nice uh, two-way file sync tool. And the idea here is that uh, rather than remote all the accesses from the VM to the host, on every read and every write, uh, another RPC has to be sent. Instead of that, instead of we do an explicit upfront sync where all the files are copied, and then Mutagen takes care of watching for uh, file updates and then staging the changes and then sending them in both directions. And uh, try to simplify the uh, user experience rather than putting yet another command and option or uh, flag or have people modify their doc compose YAMLs or any of these things. Uh, we decided to put the uh, controls in the uh, in the GUI, so I can show you that in a moment. So I'll do my my third demo, which is a Mac demo, my third attempt to write a React app. See how this one goes. So here we are on my Mac. I have the same setup as I had on Windows. But this time I'm going to go to the wheel menu, go to preferences. And I shall find the window on my other screen. Here it is. And I shall go to resources and file sharing. So here are the folders that are currently exposed and shared to the VM. So I'm going to add a new one, which is going to be where my application lives. And I'm going to flick this switch here. See how it says not cached? I intend to change that. Here we go, apply and restart. Now, of course, copying all the files into the VM may not be the right thing to do if you have 100 gigs of files because it would take too long and the VM would run out of space. But if it's hundreds of megabytes, it's kind of fine. Uh, it's worth it. Uh, so there's a little warning there just in case it's, uh, it's too large. And unfortunately, in this particular build, it has to restart the VM for the setting to take effect. So there's a short delay while the uh, 
we started some progress. This should be removed hopefully soon. So once the uh, VM restarts, then we should see some uh, status updates about the caching. Ah, yes, here we are. In fact, it says scanning files. So this is where uh, Mutagen is having a look over the uh, directory in the host, what we've asked it to sync, and it's just kind of computing what to do. And it'll make a big, like, a, you know, like a change list of some kind, and it'll uh, then start transmitting the files at the other end, gives you some progress. Won't take too long. Much faster to... Uh, do this than it is to bootstrap the whole app over uh, over Fuse with those XFS. And this is a, like a one-off cost. You do this when you when you uh, create your project, really. Like you quit your project, enable caching, and then the syncing is done. Most of the time you're making changes, you're just making small changes, and then much faster. Okay, so the caching is now ready. Don't need do this window anymore. I'm going to... Docker run, my usual thing. Now at this point, uh, we have taken the doc docker run dash v, and instead of going over the fuse mod point, it's instead using the mutagen cache. But that's transparent to your container. Then I can go into my app, and I can do npm start. And again, oh, that was pretty quick. Oh, yes, there we go. And it has started pretty fast. And I can make some changes. There we go, change have been propagated and it's done. So that was me saving the files on the host with VS Code, mutagen getting the files to events, realizing that things have changed, rescanning the relevant directories, and then transmitting the differences to the VM. And then I notify events happen magically, and then npm compiles and the browser reloads so that's all very fast um, with uh, the new feature in docker desktop edge so yeah i said it's very fast so how fast is it so again i measured uh, npm start with a few configurations i gave uh, what's the best chance i could by using the colon cached flag so the first time i ran it 15 seconds not too bad. Second run, a little bit better, a bit disappointing. As I say, um, the uh, caching isn't that aggressive, unfortunately, on Mac. Then I switched to Mutagen, where it uh, syncs up front, and then it only took five seconds, which obviously much more impressive. And in fact, well, it didn't really uh, get much better than that, but uh, yeah, five seconds is pretty negligible. And uh, as you can see from the demo, the latency of uh, propagating changes from the ID on the host all the way through the VM is pretty low too, so it's a really nice thing. So, if you have a Mac, what, is, what should you do? Well, if you're happy running Edge, I'd really recommend trying it and enabling the caching with Mutagen. It's very good. If you're in current stable, then you haven't got the new Mutagen thing, you'll have to use cached, which is better than nothing. It will help reduce CPU consumption and it will increase performance a little bit, not as, not as much as it would not as much as the code on Windows does, unfortunately. And the tips I gave before also apply here. So uh, one, minimize the size of any shared file systems. This is because when you have a large number of directories shared, they have to be watched for events. All those events have to be injected into the VM, both for notify and also for cache validation. So try to make that as small as possible. Never share your home directory or the entire entire disk never do that and uh, the second tip is to uh, use docker volumes for databases this is where the databases have to write somewhere you want it to be persistent but you're not going to read it yourself because it's all in some obscure binary format known only to mysql so use docker, docker volumes for that and that'll be native performance so then i forgot to overall i would recommend if you're on windows if you possibly can Try to upgrade to a build with WSL2. It really is worth it. It is generally available. There's no reason not to. And I, th I think a really uh, good configuration is going to be to store your source code in the Linux file system and edit it remotely uh, with something like uh, VS Code's remote WSL, which gives you the, uh, the ID on the host, but the files are saved remotely, which is as fast as it, as it needs to be. And if you're on a Mac, more complicated perhaps 
So we have to try. I would recommend trying Docker Desktop Edge, and turn on the uh, two-way sync with Mutagen, and yeah, I'll give you the latest uh, uh, build for testing in the chat. And yeah, I definitely recommend trying that and give us some feedback on how it works and let us know what what things are good, what things are bad. Apart from that, thank you very much.